I'm uh, very happy to be at the invitation of the Mises Institute and the Instituto uh, Juan de Mariana, both of which uh, do excellent work today, are the main, some of the main beacons of, of freedom, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, the main beacons of freedom in the world. So it's a great pleasure to be as associated with them. Uh, the timeliness of Adam Smith, the, the full title of my lecture is the, the Piranity of the School of Salamanca and the Timeliness of Adam Smith. But I'm always in favor of short titles, so I just put the timeliness of Adam Smith, and I'm very glad that uh, Professor S uh, Smith uh, Klein talked before me and so introduced you to the, 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 the intellectual background of, of my talk, which is uh, the, the Austrian, uh, very critical Austrian uh, view of Adam Smith um, uh, in rejection of uh, what Mary Rothbard calls the weak uh, theory of uh, science. And he, uh, his uh, predecessor in this respect was uh, Joseph Schumpeter, who was writing some uh, 40 years before Rothbard on the same uh, subjects and also characterizing uh, Adam Smith's uh, appearance as uh, a drawback in very important respects of economic science. So uh, talking now about the, the timeliness of uh, Adam Smith uh, in Salamanca at a conference dedicated to the, the cradle of, of economic theory is probably something like uh, uh, praising uh, the wicked theory at the wedding banquet of Sleeping Beauty. But nevertheless, so it's, it's a, a very old uh, <coughs> scholastic tradition to have an advocatus diaboli, a devil's advocate, uh, when we were talking about a subject in which uh, uh, well-thinking people uh, agreed on certain things, such as the inacceptability of Adam Smith. So there should be some devil's advocate uh, stating in, uh, that we, we shouldn't overstate uh, our case and uh, hear uh, the defendant's claims. So that's what I'm, uh, I, I will try to do today. Uh, render justice to Adam Smith because Adam Smith in very important respects continues a tradition that uh, has been continued in its own uh, way in Salamanca. And in particular, the very old scholastic rejection of meddling with money. Uh, Father Onthero has uh, mentioned uh, Juan de Mariana's uh, book uh, on, on the muta mutation of money, the alteration of money, uh, a book about which we will speak uh, uh, more during this conference. I know that Gabriel Casada will uh, talk to us, I, I believe, uh, at the end of uh, this day, uh, in, in the last conference on what Ber Ben Bernanke should learn or could learn from uh, Juan de Mariana. He will certainly talk about this book. Uh, Juan de Mariana himself continued a tradition that, that started in the 13th century and was uh, reached the first, the first high point in the, in the 14th century with uh, Nicolas de Oresmi's uh, treatise on the alteration of money, which was the first treatise on uh, inflation and uh, the first treatise uh, scholastic ever de dedicated to, to a completely economic subject. And because as uh, uh, we have heard uh, this morning already most treatises that the uh, scholars of the School of Salamanca authored in the uh, 16th and 17th century uh, were at the intersection, what we would call today ethics, uh, theology, uh, 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 Catholic morality, and uh, uh, juridical science and economics. So we didn't have a clear economic uh, treatise, but the first clear economic treatise, the first one was in the 14th century, Nicolas de Oresmi, uh, the confessor of uh, uh, Charles VII, uh, Bishop of Lisieux, and a strong advocate of sound money, as we would call him today. He rejected any interference of government in uh, the creation of money, the money supply, and this uh, tradition was upheld by the School of Salamanca in the 16th and 17th century, and as uh, we will uh, stress, uh, as I will stress in my talk, it was uh, upheld and uh, extended by Adam Smith in the 18th century. Now here we have therefore Adam Smith as a continuer, um, as a, in continuity with the scholastic tradition. Adam Smith was not on a, on a war path with uh, the notion established by the School of Salamanca that the economy 
the free economy, the free market, was by and large a self-regulating system. It didn't need the government uh, to keep in balance, didn't uh, need uh, government uh, intervention uh, to be uh, constantly fixed. So this is something on which Adam Smith could build. But he uh, added uh, something uh, more, namely a theory of growth, which we could not find in the previous authors. So Adam Smith, I'm, I'm not the first uh, uh, Austrian to stress the importance of Adam Smith uh, for the Austrian school. Uh, major Austrians such as Karl Menger and Ludwig von Mises have stressed this, uh, this importance. Uh, Karl Menger uh, wrote uh, actually an article on Adam Smith in which he uh, added a few critical remarks, but by and large acknowledged in Adam Smith uh, the founding father of uh, uh, economic thought and the uh, starting point for uh, his own work. Uh, um, so Menger did not refer to Cantillon, he did not refer to the scholastics, he explicitly referred to Adam Smith as the starting point of his own work and of uh, modern economics. So it's not just an Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, version of the history of economic science, it is a version that m m might be wrong, but definitely was held by uh, Menger himself. And as we have uh, learned in the about uh, 15 years ago through the work of Erich Streisler, who was a professor at the University of Vienna, uh, Karl Menger used uh, Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations as a textbook in his instruction of the crown prince of Austria, Rudolf. Uh, Karl Menger in the 1870s was for two years uh, the tutor the economics tutor of the Crown Prince Rudolf, so he, he taught him uh, lessons on a, a weekly basis and he also accompanied him on his travels throughout Europe where they would meet uh, famous scholars and uh, uh, diplomats and uh, other members of government. Uh, Menga used Adam Smith's Wealth of Nation as a book of instruction. He did not, not use his own book, right, his Principles of Economics, nor did he use of any other more recent or contemporary work. He did use Adam Smith's uh, wealth of nations and definitely would not have done this if he had thought that the book was completely unacceptable as a manual to learn uh, economics and to uh, teach uh, students. We find in Mises the same explicit endorsement of uh, the work of Adam Smith. Um, uh, I was struck by, uh, in, in reading the Mises correspondence from the 1920s and 1930s, the uh, frequent appearance of statements of his correspondence, in particular students, who uh, characterized him as an advocate of the classical school. Now this sounds weird for us uh, today. Why would they call Mises a representative of the classical school? But definitely it is because Mises endorsed classical economics, uh, the economics of Adam Smith and his disciples, uh, in important respects. That is in particular when it ca uh, came to explaining growth and uh, uh, the promotion of growth. In articles that Mises uh, published in the US, so once he had uh, emigrated to the United States uh, in 1940, articles he published in the late 1940s and 19, uh, the 1950s, there are frequent references to the economics of uh, Adam Smith and of uh, classical economics in particular in uh, the discussion of subjects that were at the time uh, approached from a Keynesian point of view. And so when Mises criticizes Keynes, he all, there's always a reference to Adam Smith and all to uh, Jean Baptiste Say, a major disciple of Adam Smith. And uh, when Mises rejects the Keynesian explanation of growth and the importance of expansionary uh, uh, economic policies to promote growth, there's always a reference to the classical school and to the notion established by Adam Smith that growth ultimately depends on the amount of capital per head, capital per capita. So Austrians have all interest in not neglecting Adam Smith who continues the uh, uh, economic thought develop, uh, developing as from the Middle Ages and then uh, promoted and uh, expanded by the school of Sal Salamanca. And we therefore uh, will now, I will uh, characterize briefly the main contributions of Adam Smith, uh, explain how they uh, relate uh, to our present situation and how far Adam Smith is timely, and uh, then uh, say a few things about the shortcomings of Adam Smith. 
So Adam uh, Smith's main contributions are, um, as, uh, uh, well, I mean, to understand Adam Smith's main contributions, we have to understand that he was reacting with his doctrine uh, against uh, the dominant thought of his time about the promotion of economic growth. And the dominant thought of the time he called mercantilism. The word mercantilism is actually a creation of Adam Smith's. Right? Nobody was using this word before him. He created this common denominator to call, uh, to give a name to this dominant uh, thought. And the characteristic feature of uh, the doctrine that he was attacking was that aggregate spending uh, was the main motor of economic growth. Aggregate monetary spending was the main motor of economic growth. Now, of course, this is very interesting, therefore I always stress this at uh, this point, because it shows that uh, he was not reacting to a very old doctrine that had no relevance uh, uh, for, for our own day. He was, in fact, reacting against the doctrine that is very present in our own day. And we had, uh, starting in the 1930s, a comeback of mercantilism. Uh, a comeback that was duly noted by scholars at the time, not only Austrians, uh, but uh, mainstream economists as well, um, as a comeback of the notion that in order to promote economic growth, you have to uh, increase the amount of money that is being spent in the economy. And if we look at Keynesian policies, Keynesian uh, policy recommendations, that's exactly what they are all about. Increase the level of aggregate spending, either through government spending, if the government is uh, uh, under the obligation to substitute itself at the place of uh, market participants, right? The market participants are sitting on their money that they don't want, don't want to spend. They're hoarding money. And so the government, beneficial agent in the economy, uh, now does what it reluctantly does, namely spend money. Uh, or it encourages spending by private persons by decreasing the interest rate, uh, therefore uh, encouraging spending by, uh, by companies. Uh, all the major arguments, in fact, even the allegedly more subtle arguments, uh, related to what Keynes calls uh, involuntary unemployment, right, the eradication of involuntary unemployment, bringing more people uh, to be ready to work by offering them higher uh, wage rates. Uh, uh, all these arguments were already present in the 18th century. Adam Smith knew these arguments, and knowing these arguments, he rejected them. So his main uh, thesis uh, were the following. Um, the level of aggregate spending is irrelevant for economic growth. The level of the money supply is irrelevant for economic growth. The price level is irrelevant for economic growth. All these monetary aspects are irrelevant. The true causes of economic growth are twofold. The main two causes are twofold. The first one is the division of labor. Adam Smith starts with a discussion of the division of labor. He starts his book, The Wealth of Nations, with a discussion of this uh, aspect. And the second one, and this, of course, is an aspect that has completely uh, been neglected in, uh, in, in our days, is the accumulation of capital. Savings. You can promote growth by leading a frugal life. You can promote aggregate growth. And he argued, thirdly, that the policies recommended by the mercantilists simply do not work. The mercantilists had uh, advocated uh, a policy of uh, promoting um, exports and discouraging imports. And the objective, the ultimate objective, was to promote aggregate spending. If you export goods and services, you uh, increase the amount of money that flows into the country. If you discourage imports, you diminish the amount of money that flows out of the country. So the ultimate effect would be that the amount of money, the money supply within the borders of the nations increases, and therefore aggregate spending will increase. So these were the mercantilist policies. So Adam Smith says, well, that's not true. The, um, the level of spending has nothing to do with economic growth. And actually what uh, the mercantilist policy boils down to is to make the uh, use of capital less efficient by artificially stimulating exports, we artificially stimulate the international division of labor at the uh, expense of national division of labor. Now, because it's being done artificially, it means that capital is diverted from the uses where it would have uh, realized uh, the greatest return, 
because that's where entrepreneurs would have spontaneously invested their capital if they had been free. And now it's being invested in venues where it is less, it, it creates less of a return from an aggregate point of view. Similarly, by discouraging imports, you do the opposite thing. You discourage the international division of labor at the, uh, to the benefit of the national di uh, division of labor. But the point is that this use of capital then is again inefficient. If entrepreneurs had been free to choose uh, the use of their capital, they would apparently have uh, used it more for uh, uh, international cooperation, this cr creating the highest returns. But now the government discourages cooperation with foreigners, therefore capital is used differently. And this different use is necessarily less efficient, brings less of a return than the one that would have been chosen spontaneously by entrepreneurs. That is Adam Smith's argument. It's all about the uses of capital. Right? The relative uh, returns created by capital right? based on the, the uh, hypothesis, and that's a rea realistic hypothesis, that if you let entrepreneurs choose freely the use of their capital, they will tend to use those uses that are most beneficial for themselves and therefore also create their highest aggregate return. The significance of Adam Smith in the history of economic thought is not that maybe that he was particularly original in each uh, single thesis that he advocated, uh, in fact, as Schumpeter and Murray Rothbard have argued uh, correctly, uh, every single major idea advocated by Adam Smith had already been present in the literature before him. Therefore, one of the frequent charges against Adam Smith is that he was a plagiarist because often he didn't quote his, his sources. But there is certainly merit in bringing together dis desperate, disparate ideas separate ideas that had been scattered throughout the literature into a systematic treatise. And that is exactly the main contribution of Adam Smith. He created the first systematic treatise on economic growth. And in that respect, he uh, delivered the same contribution as uh, Nicholas Oresme, whom I already mentioned, uh, four centuries earlier. Nicholas Oresme, too, was not original in most of the points that he made, he brought together a literature that was scattered throughout many articles and, uh, and books and showed how th uh, all these different ideas could be integrated, could be synthesized into a systematic uh, analysis of the problem at stake. And that's the great contribution of Adam Smith. There were all elements ready for a theory of growth. Adam Smith brought them together and showed what the main causes of uh, uh, growth were, and he was especially the first uh, economist to clearly formulate the crucial question that we still face today, uh, namely the question uh, which role money and uh, monetary expenditure plays within the economic system. What is the role of aggregate demand, of aggregate uh, revenue, monetary revenue, uh, for the working of the market economy? So Adam Smith was the first one to clearly formulate this crucial question and to answer it, and in his answer, refuting the main errors prevalent at his time. Uh, and of course, he, uh, his answers were imperfect, and he did deviate economics in important respect. Right? So we mentioned the, the theory of prices. Right? Adam Smith endorsed uh, a cost of production explanation of, of prices, and in that respect, uh, uh, created a regress in economic analysis, but this no, does not diminish uh, his merits on these other fronts. We can compare him with another great Austrian scholar, well, Adam Smith is not an Austrian scholar, but with another scholar that is important of the, for the Austrian school, namely uh, Eugen uh, von Böhm-Bawerk. Böhm-Bawerk was the first economist to clearly formulate the question at stake in the theory of interest, namely the question why the uh, the spread between sales revenues and cost expenditure of firms tends not to get eradicated completely on the market. And he was the first then to systematically answer this question, proposing his own solution. His own solution, his own answer was that there was time preference, and as a consequence of time preference, sales revenues are never entirely equal to the cost expenditure of firms. 
and also to refute the main errors in, in the field, right? Refuting various productivity theories, productivity explanations of interest, and so on. And as in the case of Smith, uh, bim answers were not perfect, right? So later uh, economists, in particular Aus economists of the Austrian schools, did correct bim in important respects. Right? For example, uh, Frank Vetter and uh, Ludwig von Mises uh, reformulated the theory of time preference and created a pure theory of time preference, whereas Bimbavec had integrated time preference along with other elements. But again, this does not diminish the importance of his contribution. The contribution of Adam Smith is highly timely uh, because, uh, again, the, 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 uh, the debate that we are uh, leading today again uh, in confronting uh, a world economic crisis is the same that Adam Smith confronted in his day. It's uh, a debate at the center of which is the question, which role does money play and which role does aggregate expenditure play for the operation of a market economy? Can we confront the economy by increasing or stabilizing, at least, aggregate expenditure? Can we uh, promote growth by uh, prom uh, promoting uh, the, uh, an increase of aggregate expenditure, or at least stabilize aggregate expenditure. And even, even if we reason today completely in, in the terms proposed by Adam Smith, we would still get convincing answers. How would Adam Smith analyze our present situation? Well, he would still say, well, we have a stock of capital, real capital, not, not money, uh, tickets, and so on, stock of real capital, that is consumer goods, uh, factors of production, uh, that we can use in production. These physical supplies are limited and on the free market they would be used to the most efficient extent if the government comes into play and saves uh, companies that have made wrong investments, that, has, that are using factors by creating value that is uh, inferior to the value that they consume, well we are impoverishing the nation as a whole, we are impoverishing the whole world as a whole. So it's not a suitable way to confront the, uh, situ uh, the, the present situation uh, to, uh, to get us out of the crisis. It is a way of well, stabilizing uh, the situation of some market participants at the expense of all others. And in the aggregate, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not that just some gain and others lose, but it's a negative-sum game, right? Because we are losing in the aggregate because we are consuming our capital. So I think we can give convincing and correct answers uh, analysis of the uh, present situation, even if we did know anything about modern Austrian capital theory and Austrian price theory and so on, and reason entirely in terms proposed by Adam Smith. Now, that's, this does not mean that we should not rely on those most, more sophisticated arguments developed by the Austrians. Adam Smith did have uh, shortcomings. What are the main shortcomings in, in his doctrine? The main shortcomings are uh, lacking analysis of money, a lacking analysis of the prices, the price system, and uh, his ne neglect of the time factor. Let me say a few words about each of them. Uh, the main shortcoming from an Austrian point of view is, of course, Adam Smith's price theory. He didn't have a convincing price theory. But this, this did not vitiate his entire economic thought. Because if you read The Wealth of Nations, you will find that uh, market prices play virtually no role in his whole argument. The argument is based on the scarcity of capital and uses that we can make of capital. The question how capital is used concretely and which, which role uh, do prices play in, the, uh, in, in using capital, in investing capital, is not answered by Adam Smith, simply not addressed. The argument is always the capital is scarce. If government intervenes, it disrupts the uses of capital that would have been made on the free market. These mar uh, market uses would a priori have brought, ex ante would have brought the highest returns from the point of view of the investors. So government by intervening always disrupts uh, this equilibrium and always uh, brings about a less efficient use of capital. Right. So he didn't have a good uh, price theory, he didn't vitiate his, uh, uh, his uh, doctrine, but of course you can reinforce the analysis proposed by Adam Smith by doing precisely this, by, by basing it on a more sophisticated uh, view of the role that prices play 
in the market process. And this is exactly what the uh, Austrian school has allowed us to do. Uh, the Austrian school has created a realistic uh, explanation of market prices, starting with Karl Menger, and then of money prices in particular. And as a consequence, Austrians are able to explain how the different investment projects relate to one another. And this was, Adam Smith was unable to do this. And uh, uh, Austrians in particular, uh, following Böhm Bawerk, have brought the time factor into play. It's another crucial uh, aspect that Adam Smith neglected and which is uh, especially important to understand the, uh, the business cycle. The last point, uh, I said uh, the neglect of uh, money uh, is a, uh, might be surprising given that this was at the center of economic thought, uh, of Adam Smith's uh, thought. Uh, well, the fact is that Adam Smith, in rejecting the notion that uh, monetary spending and money prices have anything to do with uh, economic growth, went a little bit over the top um, in uh, asserting that money has no influence on the economy at all. Uh, the one who has clear, most clearly formulated this, this idea that money has no influence on the economy at, at all uh, was a mid-19th century disciple of Adam Smith's, namely John Stuart Mill. Right? John Stuart Mill formulated the doctrine of the uh, wheel of money. Money is just a wheel. Uh, so money prices are just superimposed over, uh, over uh, uh, real prices, uh, price ratios, just like a wheel is superimposed over the, the face of a bride, uh, and as the uh, bridegroom hopes that the, the veal will not affect the, the underlying face of the bride, so John Stuart Mill and the other classical economists were convinced that the price system did not affect the uh, real economy underlying. Now this is of course a notion that Austrians following Ludwig von Mises uh, have uh, rejected, uh, arguing that money profoundly affects the structure of production. In particular, money production affects the structure of production, but also the demand for money affects the structure of production. Right. But it does not, and also, all, Austrians have always stressed that it does not follow from this that you can create an overall aggregate increase of production by manipulating the demand and supply for money. So in conclusion, let me stress that, uh, well, Adam Smith in important respects is not outside of the tradition that starts in the Middle Ages, the scholastic uh, tradition of economic analysis, which starts in the Middle Ages with the School of Paris, uh, uh, Aquinas, uh, then extends to Nicolas Eresme in the 14th century, was continued with the uh, uh, neo-scholastics, uh, the School of Salamanca in the 16th and the 17th century, but it was well embedded in this tradition and uh, complemented it by adding a systematic analysis of the factors making for economic growth. The contributions of Adam Smith are particularly timely in our own uh, situation. Adam Smith was ultimately confronting the same questions that we are again un uh, uh, asking ourselves today. And therefore we might say that uh, uh, the road from Salamanca to Vienna and to Auburn is a roundabout road that leads through Glasgow. Thank you.